Hey, thank you for jo joining us to today, everyone. We're really delighted to have Deepika Bhattapati. Am I saying it right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, great. Uh, from from Athelos, and uh, I want to tell our audience a little bit about why we're so excited. So you're going to see a lot of really smiling faces from NAMI Montana and, you know, with the overall tech move into mental health, it feels like there's a new startup every day that helps out people with anxiety or people with depression. And we don't always see it for the most seriously mentally ill or the people in the, in the greatest need. And um, to see uh, something come out that's exciting for people with treatment resistant de depression, exciting about closet being is so wonderful and, and important. So we are really delighted to have De Deepika on here. Um, for those of us that have worked in mental illness for a long time, it is astonishing what can happen to people's lives when they're able to get in a good routine with clozapine. So we're delighted to have, have you with us, Topeka. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, yes, very, very happy to be here. And thank you for inviting me to speak. You know, we have been um, big proponents of, you know, the, the correct use of blood testing for clozapine and increasing access to medications like clozapine. I know it's a difficult drug to um, initiate on and uh, remain on due to the uh, blood testing barrier. And so hopefully our technology and the advancements that we were able to make technically are, are going to propagate to the medical community and the treatment resistant schizophrenia community to allow uh, more patients to initiate on this um, brilliant drug. Thank you. Can you tell us a, a, a little bit about your story and the company's founding? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, like you mentioned, my name is Deepika. I'm one of the co-founders here at Athelis. Um, we started the company in uh, summer of 2016, um, and we raised our first round of funding early 2017. And so the company initially started with um, this concept that uh, if you can build technology that's cheap enough and easy enough to use, um, then people will use it more and engage in it more. And if that technology is actually quite meaningful, then if people are engaging it more, then they will be identifying diseases earlier and you will be able to create that preventative healthcare system that we all are trying to um, push towards. And so that the first iteration of that started with our Athelis One device, which is a device that looks very similar to an Amazon Alexa. Um, and with just, you know, with a finger prick of blood, what our device essentially does is we take a test strip, we, um, it auto smears in that test strip. And uh, we take that test strip and we put it inside our device and our device is able to grab very high res images of that strip and essentially just count just as a pathologist might do under a microscope. How many white blood cells are there? How many red blood cells? How many platelets? How many neutrophils? In this case, it is how many white blood cells and neutrophils uh, to ultimately get your absolute neutrophil count, which is what is needed for um, the REMS clozapine registry and for continued use on the medication. And so we started with that version. Um, and shortly after we got our point of care clearance, we, you know, were, uh, we had some articles published about it. Um, and we actually ended up getting a lot of interest, inbound interest from uh, different communities around mental health that were asking about the device for um, clozapine patients. And it was very interesting because this is not, uh, this was not an immediate thought for us on where the device could end up. Um, you know, initially when you think of 
your, you know, neutropenia and white blood cell counts, you're thinking of cancer patients, you know, um, patients that are on immunosuppressive medication and, you know, your mind doesn't go to schizophrenia at all. And so when we started getting this inbound, it, it was very fascinating and humbling to learn so much about this industry that we knew nothing about and this, uh, this drug, um, the efficacy of it, the importance of it, the societal importance of it, and uh, understanding how we could be helpful in that effort. And so that is when we started really crafting what does this product look like? And so, you know, we learned that there are about a million people that should be on the drug um, and about a hundred something thousand that are on it today. And so one of the big barriers to that drug is that there needs to be a regular blood draw. And it's it, coordination is difficult, um, and just the, the the you know removing blood every every single week for the first six months is obviously very challenging. Coordinating with the pharmacy is challenging. I think a lot of physicians have a difficult time trying to initiate patients on the drug because they also there's quite a bit of oversight that they need to do for patients who are on the drug, and that can be challenging. Um, you need a good amount of cooperation from the patient and their supporting system. That's also challenging. And so we tried to come up with a program that addressed each of these things. And so the way the device and, and our program works with clozapine is that we are able to, I mean, now with our home clearance, we are able to actually get the device in patients' homes um, on top of just living in the point of care setting. This can actually be bedside in patients' homes. And uh, the way it works is that, you know, you prick your finger, you put it against the test strip, just as you would a diabetes test strip, the blood will flow through, you stick that test strip in the device and you plus start. Uh, the device will run for a couple minutes and the results, you'll be able to view those results. Those results are actually transmitted directly to REMS. And we also ping our connected pharmacy that those results have been successfully transmitted to REMS, that this patient is ready to receive their medication. We'll actually dispense the medication directly to that patient. So we'll ship it directly to that patient um, so that they're able to stay you know, compliant with their um, medication. And so that's kind of the end-to-end -end program. It, it reduces a lot of the burden with the physician as well because of the REMS. You know, you don't have the challenges with the pharmacy and it's a lot easier for patients. So we found that reception has been very, very positive, as you can imagine, um, when patients were previously going to LabCorp or some kind of lab for a blood draw. And now they can just do it by a finger stick. Um, it's been life-changing for a lot of patients and uh, we're, we're thrilled to be serving the community and um, kind of double downing on that effort with the new home clearance. That's wonderful. Thank, thank you. And uh, Dr. Riza Husseini Gomi from Frontier Psychiatry has joined us. Riza, can you tell us a little bit about from a psychiatrist standpoint, what, what working with patients with clozapine has been like before? Uh, so before the use of like a remote patient monitoring, um, very difficult. I think uh, psychiatrists or really any providers, you know, and I, and I work across neurology as well. And we use, uh, for example, clozapine is a really good medication for a lot of our patients with Parkinson's dementia. Cause I, I practice movement disorders and, you know, dementia. So but boy, is it hard. So I, I've had patients throughout the years, both with schizophrenia, treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Uh, if it was, you know, there's certain side effects to take into mind with clozapine, but really the biggest limiting factor is the registry and the need for the uh, the neutrophil counts. I mean, that's that's by far, and I think any, any provider would agree with that. That's a reason people don't get access to medication that has the best evidence in many arenas, including Parkinson's disease and dementia. And so, I mean, it's not just uh, schizophrenia. So um, it's been really hard. You know, I, I have, I had patients on before using uh, Athelis and we actually, we're still in the midst of uh, rolling out Athelis. So background there is across frontier. We did a pilot, went really well. 
um, with I think like about 50 patients. And now we're rolling out to a couple thousand patients. So we're expanding uh, the program quite a bit. And so we're, we, we're not just doing, uh, we're not just interested in clozapine and neutrophil combo, we're really supporting the practice with you know, blood pressure, heart rate, um, there's glucose, uh, others. So it's, it's really nice. We have these options. Um, so patients on any antipsychotic long-term, we're able to track you know, their metabolic risk factors. Um, but yeah, in terms of clozapine, very difficult. Uh, and I would say, I don't know the data and the, re- the literature, but I imagine is a significant, I mean, a huge under usage of clozapine because of that challenge. Um, so it could reach a lot more people. And, and I mean, of the people that could benefit from clozapine, I bet less than 5% get it is, is what I would bet um, without knowing the literature. Thank you so much, Raisa. Um, I guess, to, to Pika, can you talk a little bit about what it has been like to roll out to these di- different states? And, you know, was there one area of the country that maybe got, got you going a, a, a little bit? Because you haven't been doing this for that long. What does it yeah. look like? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we're based in California. We're based in Northern California. Um, one of the places that has adopted technology uh, quickly and with open arms was um, the San Diego area. I would say there's a lot of um, fantastic psychiatrists there, like Dr. Jonathan Meyer, who writes on um, clozapine and appropriate usage of it and how to uh, initiate patients on it. Um, he has a handbook uh, that has inc- he's been so thoughtful to include us in. He has been a fantastic proponent in that area. And um, because of him and many other folks just like him, we were able to get into a lot of both private practices, residential facilities, um, locked facilities. So that's been great. And then um, the California State Hospital System uses our device for, uh, you know, across all the state hospitals. Um, And that's also been really great because that's kind of all through California. And so once that happened, you know, particularly during COVID, there was so much legitimacy that was lent to us. And that's really when a lot of folks started, you know, saying, oh, like this is interesting and this could be helpful for patients. And patients were reaching out independently and taking it up to their physicians. And so, um, you know, the, the whole thing was kind of like a, a cycle, but I would say that San Diego, we definitely have a stronghold there and, um, a lot of, uh, fantastic doctors at, you know, sharp, uh, like Dr. Brian Miller, um, and some other folks that, that have just been great, good sounding boards. Um, you know, initially when we started the program with the device didn't connect to REMS, you know, it was just something that it was just a finger prick. Um, and then you get your results. But I think as a tech company, it's really important for us to to listen to what physicians have to say and listen to what patients have to say, because this is something that's entirely new to us. And we just want to build really for for you guys. And so uh, when we were listening to that feedback, and we're so fortunate to have customers that know exactly what they want and what that dream state could be. And that's something that they just told us. And so that was great for us. We went back to the drawing board and saw how can we get these results into REMS to actually allow the process to be a lot more streamlined. Because, I mean, these doctors were telling us that they would get frantic calls from the pharmacy, from patients who are waiting there for their fill. And then the pharmacist comes out and says, oh, we don't have your results. Your results are not in REMS. The patient has to then call their physician you know, make sure that the results are faxed over. And then once it's faxed over, make sure the pharmacy gets it and then pass the medication. I mean, I can understand why this would be such a challenge and um, obstacle to overcome for, for many of these patients. And so it was something that we had built in every iteration of the product, right? Like we have a portal that all of these results can appear in. Um, there is you know, ways that you can stack rank those results. Um, You can see which patients have fallen off of the program if you're a physician. And so it ultimately just provides more visibility for them on who's remaining compliant with their meds, who's not, 
um, and also simultaneously making it easier for the patient to actually test and receive their meds with the finger stick device plus the shipment of their meds through our pharmacy. That's really great. I guess one of the questions that I, I have is, is working with different machine learning researchers and folks is how, how did you get started with this? It seems like there always has to be some starting case that that begins you on the path where you can kind of bring in some data and begin to learn because I know like there's always the concerns about you know is this some fake technology but but at least when I heard your co-founder talk it did sound like it was pretty incremental and brought along can you talk about that a little bit yeah you know initially we had never set out to start a company that did exactly what we were doing. It was just kind of curiosity and following our curiosity that led us to the point of saying, oh, like this could be interesting. Like maybe let's let's raise a little capital and see if people want this and if it's useful to some folks. And so um, initially, like I mentioned, we were very oncology focused. You know, we thought uh, we needed to get into a lot of a lot of these community oncology settings to get patients using the technology, um, but there was a lot of interest, inbound interest, from people who were the support systems for folks that um, are taking clozapine or doctors who just cared so much and just had been trying to get people on clozapine for years. And they were like, this would be so helpful. And, you know, uh, Deanna Kelly, who's a fantastic researcher um, in Maryland and someone who spends a lot of time specifically on clozapine research, she reached out to us and she said, you know, like th this is going to be game changing in the space. You should really consider pivoting and um, learning about this population. And then we also had a lot of pharmacies reach out to us, not just from the US, but from Canada and from all kinds of places. And so that was very interesting because it felt like it was this one thing that everyone was aligned on, like psychiatrists, state hospitals, patients, caregivers. It was like, and, and that, in healthcare, it's kind of rare to find that. And so what we wanted to do is we just wanted to, even if it was a small group of people, we wanted to build something that they just loved, that they couldn't get enough of, and that they really wanted to continue sticking with. And uh, that meant it needed to be really easy, you know, really easy because um, this could be used in any kind of point of care setting. And so it, we needed to make sure connectivity was really good. Um, if it was gonna be in state hospitals, places that have you know, pretty heavy structures around them, they, it need, connectivity needs to be like a non-issue. And uh, so we had to iterate quite a bit, you know, make sure that we were up to par when it comes to cybersecurity and um, HIPAA. And, uh, and then it really was about getting it out to patients and having them use it. Um, and then once they used it, understanding what their feedback is and just slowly iterating, iterating, iterating. And of course, this was all after we got our FDA clearance, right? And so when we were getting our FDA clearance, it doesn't really, um, you know, we, we didn't know that it was going to be intended for this case. All we knew was that we needed to create a device that was substantially equivalent to uh, the results that you get when you run like a Sysmex or you know the the technology that you have at LabCorp or at any lab setting, you know the the white blood cell and the ANC needs to be equivalent. And so that was the main thing we were focused on. Once we got that clearance, then it was like, great, who can we benefit the most with something like this? And we created whole teams that went out into the community and installed devices in various settings, um, trained different people on how to use it, on how to troubleshoot and, you know, created programs where people, you know, staff should be able to run a hundred tests in a day if that's what they need to do because 
well, there are some places that we do test about 100 clozapine patients a day. And so that's, you know, quite a few patients in those uh, settings are, uh, they, they have a lot of very unique um, circumstances around them. And so we have to work around all of those things and ultimately build custom solutions that patients and caregivers alike love. Thank you. We, we've got a couple of questions that came in. Um, so uh, th thank you. There's a question about dual, dual diagnoses, schizophrenia and uh, dr drug use, particular meth. And then they asked if it's better than uh, Abilify. And, and I will just say we can't prescribe on, on this. You know, this is something that people really, you have to work with your doctor and especially for clozapine, you're not wandering into a clozapine prescription. This is working very closely with your psychiatrist. I think that the main thing is, is, is you can have conversations with your psychiatrist about home health monitoring and about some of these options. Um, but, but we just on this webinar, e even with Dr. Husseini Gomi on, we're not going to be able to give prescription advice to anybody. Um, Topeka, can, can you tell people a little bit of guidance on how they can bring this up to their psychiatrist or from a patient or family standpoint? How? Yeah, you know, ultimately the decision is lies entirely between you and your psychiatrist. Um, but, you know, what you can say is that, uh, you know, we have our website, athelis.com. Um, if you look up Athelis and Clauseril, there are, you know, we have papers that have been published um, that show how we are helpful in that space. But Ultimately, what you would want to chat with your psych on is if you both, uh, um, you know, choose to go down the road of Clauseril, the way that our device works is, you know, it's a device that can live either with you at home or it can be in your doctor's office and um, will work with your doctor on the appropriate program to get you on um, with our pharmacy delivering the meds to you and all of that. But ultimately, it's meant to do finger stick and C uh, monitoring that is compliant with REMS and sends those results directly to REMS. And so um, saves them quite a bit of work and hopefully streamlines the process for you. But you can show them our website. We have a support tab that you can reach out to us directly through um, you or your physician and, and any information that you would like if you want us to provide you with some information that you can take to your physician, that's something that we do as well. So um, those are a couple different options. Excellent. Th thank you. We, we, we've got a, two questions in from Jen Sorakim. Uh, with the new clozapine REMS program that started in November of 2021, has Athelis changed how they upload ANCs to the REMS program? with the patient status form change? Yes, so um, yeah, there were some big changes that uh, were made to REMS. And so, you know, we're still uploading results. Um, we were able to adapt to those changes um, and are, you know, we, we support thousands of clozapine patients um, today. And so we, there was really no choice but to continue, um, you know, changing and, uh, figure out how we could work with the new REMS program, which we have now. So uh, yeah, we still do that. Great, yeah, I know for all of us that live in a regulated environment, it's always exciting to see what the next one coming down <laughs> is and how you need yeah. to adjust everything in your world to comply with it. Yes, <laughs> so, never know. <laughs> again, thank you for doing technology and healthcare. This is what we <laughs> um, so another great question from Jin Sora Kim. Could you share how the California state hospitals were able to implement Athelos at a state facility? Yeah, so um, with California state hospitals, actually, 
fairly straightforward. Um, they reached out to us. They were interested. They have a pretty significant clausural population. Um, they wanted several devices in different locations and um, they have a fairly custom solution. And we gave them devices, test strips, a, a custom dashboard and um, support and taught everyone how to use it, how to get those devices up and running. We have built our technology to be as simple as possible for staff to be able to use. And so that was something that um, they, they were able to grasp very quickly. They moved you know, for a government body, like they moved very quickly. They were able to get budget together um, make a case for the importance of this and get it approved. And so once it was approved, it was really just a matter of us deploying um, in the facility how they wanted us to. That's great. Th thank you. So another qu question that came in, this one from Ian McCrane. With clozapine initiation, the seat reactive protein is good to monitor with or is good to monitor with initial titration to reduce myocarditis. Could your product do this with more development? Uh, you know, this is like a common question that we get asked, um, you know, can you do CRP? Uh, can you do a lipid panel? Um, we're actually not able to do those things right now using the technology that we have. Our technology is vision-based. And so we're able to look at um, what is morphologically available in the blood uh, you know, very similar to this resolution of a microscope. And so um, CRP is not something that we would be able to detect at this point. Um, it's something that currently we're not capable of doing, but um, if it's something that keeps continuing to come up and it would be really helpful in the space, then, um, then it would be something that we would throw into development R&D. Um, in terms of those patients that experience those uh, side effects uh, around myocarditis or high blood pressure, you know, we do have um, a remote patient monitoring program that we put psych folks um, who are eligible on. And for those patients, we're able to monitor those side effects. I believe that's what Frontier is um, using and ha has piloted and is now rolling out, which is um, great. I'm glad they had a good experience. And so, um, for, for those patients, we have other solutions. It's just not blood testing. Are you sure uh, you don't want to, um, you know, take over Theranos and, and start doing that? <laughs> it's tempting, right? Like who doesn't want to do that? I think, uh, I think that we, we all know how that went when yeah. uh, there were big claims about easy at-home blood tests. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot harder than it, than it sounds. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, you know, the name of the game when it comes to blood testing is be scoped and be FDA cleared. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Gomi, can you, can you describe a little bit about how Athelis popped up on your radar? And I mean, I think it says something a little bit about Frontier Psychiatry, which we're grateful to have in Montana and kind of how this relationship to develop? Yeah, I mean, I actually am trying to remember, I don't know if it, which direction it went, but I think Athelis was doing some some marketing. And so we were looking at remote patient monitoring. So it might've actually been, can't remember which direction it went in, but either way we were, you know, here we are. And at the time we actually started talking, you know, we were a lot smaller back then, but we realized that we're trying to be the one-stop shop for behavioral health care. And in order to do that, and we're fully remote, and so we knew that we couldn't just be seeing patients via a video platform and calling it a day. We really need to know how are our patients doing on other levels, such as, you know, their neutrophil count or their blood pressure. And so that's where that came from. And so we did a market, uh, kind of a little quick market analysis. You know, there's, there's a number of uh, competitors, but not, not like so many that it was hard to kind of, you know, talk to each one. I thought this really stood out because for, they do kind of an end-to-end -end offer, which makes it very easy for a start, up and coming startup like us to get going with it. Meaning there, it was all, everything was included. You just, they take over from identify, helping identify which patients, filtering them, bringing the entire list, getting the devices out, getting them 
doing the communication, getting them on the device. I can't tell you how, um, what the, one of the most impressive things has been how easy it's been for that step, the patient's getting on the device. You can imagine we're taking care of the sickest people across, I mean, healthy as well, but I mean, the whole spectrum, we, we get discharges from the Montana State Hospital from Warm Springs. I mean, we, there's nobody we don't see. And the, the, by far the biggest uh, uh, population we work with is Medicaid. And so we see we're across all the prisons, you know, we're in nursing homes, we're people, you know, farmers and ranchers. So we're seeing everybody. There's no, nowhere in Montana we don't touch. So you can imagine someone getting a device in the mail who's not maybe as technologically literate, how difficult that can be. Athelis has been so much easier to use. You think it'd be more complicated, but just getting someone on a video call to see us for the appointment is actually harder. So it's, you know, these cellular enabled, very easy setup devices. So it's very impressive that that workflow has been honed that well. And if I'll put it this way, if we can use it in Montana, you can use it anywhere in the US. I, I, there's, you know, this is definitely the proving ground. Um, and you know, I, I can say that with some confidence. And so that piece has been easy, but then all the way to the patient using it, submitting their data, we're now working on an integration to bring that data automatically into our EHR to put it in the hands of the providers. Cause at the end of the day, that's where it needs to be to make it easier. But Athelis actually has a whole nursing team. So any aberrant, uh, you know, abnormalities when it comes to blood pressure are automatically flagged, responded to quickly. Um, and that's all brought to our attention. And then they even handle kind of the insurance and billing piece. And we're proud that we've been able to set up a system where um, this costs uh, members uh, nothing beyond what their insurance pays. So we, were, we wanted to make sure we are offering this and making it as accessible as possible. So we, you know, we do normal insurance billing. Uh, through Athelis, but we don't charge anything above and beyond that. So if we don't get paid, we don't get paid. Um, so that was what was so impressive is the entire, when you really think about it, this is where healthcare gets complicated from, okay, identified a patient, now actually getting them to use it, submitting it, you know, provider seeing it, billing going, all that. It's a complicated, there's a lot of steps in there. And they've been handling all of that very smoothly. Um, so I would just kind of just big shout out in terms of that. That's no small feat. That's, that's impressive in healthcare. Absolutely. So we, we have a related question um, and probably to both of you, because it fits right in the middle of where between you both. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about cost and cost savings for the provider, patient, even the state hospitals? And if we can start, start with you, Topeka, and then if you can weigh in at, after that, raise them. Yeah, so um, there have been a number of studies that have been done on the cost of a patient who's not on clozapine and then the cost of a patient after they're on clozapine. And I don't want to throw a number out there because the studies are a little bit conflicting, um, but very conclusively, uh, you know, on the order of tens of thousands of dollars are saved uh, every time a patient initiates on the medication that should be initiated on the medication. And so, um, you know, th that, and that's, those costs are all through the spectrum. It's, you know, from patients not decompensating from the other meds that they're on, um, hospitalizations, inpatient stays, doctors visits, medication costs, um, and then even like societal costs. And so uh, there, there's massive cost savings all the way up to something like $80,000 per patient per year. Um, for the cost of a patient who's, uh, you know, not on clozapine to them getting them on clozapine, but that, that's what the cost savings can be up to. And so it's, um, it, it's very interesting to, to understand kind of the, the impact of the medication. Uh, we try to make this uh, program accessible to anyone who needs to be on it. And so, and any practice that meet, that wants to utilize it. And so with that, we have pretty specific cost models that we work when we work with different kinds of settings and community settings versus Medicaid um, centers versus county settings versus state hospitals and jails and all of that. So it's, it's all very different, but ultimately, um, I think that when you have a patient that's able to initiate and stay on a medication in a more stable way, you inevitably end up with major cost savings, if not just in time as well. Thank you. And I can um, share a little bit about you know, our strategy here. 
Um, so big picture when we zoom out, um, you know, Montana, I believe, is um, the highest rate of fee for service proportion of insurance, you know, reimbursements in the country, meaning, and in no surprise, you know, it's a, it's a more rural state, but the most fee for service is happening in Montana, where in other states, right, a, a larger growing percentage, and actually many states, a, a majority now are becoming more of the value based care model. And there's, there's lots of variations in that. That's a whole, that's a story for another day. But the point is, we want to, at Frontier, we want to start really tying patients and how they're doing the quality of our care to our reimbursements, meaning we want to move towards a model where Blue Cross pays us based on the fact that we're taking good care of the patients, not based on the fact that I had I saw 10 patients today for 10 hours, um, because that doesn't really at the end of the day correlate with how that patient is doing. And so Athelis remote patient monitoring is critical to that because we need to know their blood pressure, all of that good, good stuff in order to then prove our quality and, and actually achieve our quality. So if a patient's blood pressure or glucose is starting to you know, trend upwards, well, if I'm waiting for them to go in and in Montana, right, they might not see their doctor for a while. And if it's an annual visit, I want to jump on top of that. If they're, if I'm, if I have them on a, a second generation antipsychotic and it's causing the metabolic risk factors I need to address, I want to know right away um, and jump on that. I'm going to, you know, avoid diabetes developing, avoid a hospitalization for various reasons, down those downstream strokes. So you can imagine it's hard to put a number on it, but you can imagine these earlier interventions lead to a huge cost savings for the system. But more importantly, the patient does better. They're healthier and they, they do better long-term. It also helps us keep, keep in line with guidelines. You know, we should be checking these uh, various things for patients on a regular basis. So that's the, that's the big picture we want to achieve. And it's going to help us move towards that mission by being able to uh, track patients. So it's, there's cost savings over the life cycle, of course, the, this entire experience for a patient. Um, so it's helpful for cost savings for the system, for the state, for the payers, um, but for patients too, right? Because again, I don't want patients to be hospitalized. I don't want them to have huge co-pays for that. Um, I don't want them to um, have a lot, like what Depco was saying is starting and stopping medications. There's a lot of cost to that. You know, insurances reject, you know, your, your medications because they're like, well, you were on this one. Oh, you're, you're double dosing, or you already have this other prescription floating out there. So the, I think there's a lot of avenues here where there's cost savings. So we, we had a question from Dr. Eric Arzubi, also Frontier Psychiatry. Um, have you put the devices in prisons to help care for inmates with mental illness? And just to put this in context, as Dr. Gary Mahalish uh, from NAMI Montana mentions often, you know, the Montana State Prison is the biggest psychiatric facility in the state of Montana. So we have so many of our people in the prisons that require both care and monitoring. Is that somewhere that you're at now or are, are there barriers to it? Um, it? The barriers that there are, there's a lot of interest. I mean, we're in a lot of state hospitals um, and locked facilities right now. Um, there are certain places where patients are there, but it's very transient. So they're only there for a short amount of time. We like to set our device up in places that patients are going to really be there longitudinally. Um, but in terms of prison settings, I, I believe we, we, maybe we do have a couple um, clients that are prisons, um, but there it's, it's used more intermittently, right? Like a patient comes in, they're there for like a few weeks and then they actually move around, right? That they don't typically stay there for a long time. And so in those places it's used, but just not as often also. Uh, for, for those places, given that it is more intermittent use, it's kind of a heavy lift for administrative folks to get clearance for it. Because, you know, with, with government facilities, there's going to be a good amount of bureaucracy and red tape to overcome to actually get this device through. And um, for the intermittent use, oftentimes it may not be, uh, you know, a priority for the administration, but um, it's something that we actively do try to do. Thank you. I guess since, since we've got you, it'd be, be really interesting to hear from someone who's been in the weeds of developing a home healthcare monitoring company. Where do you think it's going? I mean, what, what does that look like 
in, in the future. And I kind of love that your company works with doctors. It's not claiming it replaces in, in anybody, but I just, just would love to hear your thoughts on what you see and kind of what you envision for the next 10 years or so. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because psychiatry is a space that when when we said initially that we work with a lot of psychiatrists, people were so perplexed initially by that. They're, you're a blood testing company that works with psychiatrists. Um, you know, they're like, how does that actually, you know, wh where did the dots connect? Um, and so this whole foray into psychiatry has been so fascinating because there are so many different medications that are so powerful that require additional monitoring um, and, you know, monitoring of symptoms and side effects. And so that was something that we started when we started learning about was something that we were like, great, like this is something that we want to really develop tools to get embedded in a lot of these different uh, psych practices. And we also build tools for psych practices. So what, you know, some initial feedback that we got from physicians was, you know, we don't know if patients are not taking their medication or if the medication is just not working. Um, and so we built something called uh, the pill track, which is a device that has, you know, several docs for you to put your different medications and using different lights, it will actually tell you whether or not you've taken your meds for that day and remind you to take your meds if you haven't. And um, we program it for every single patient specific to that patient. And so, you know, the usage on that satisfaction on that NPS with that has been really um, exceed, have really exceeded expectations. And I think that has been really great for both um, provider and patient because providers are just able to have additional clinical data points to understand, you know, is this medication actually working or why is the patient not taking the medication at all? Um, you know, just for the end state of the well-being of the patient, those those things are fairly important. So we started there, and then you know we we've now expanded to almost every specialty in healthcare. The way I see healthcare going is, you know, we need to figure out what kind of sensors for each specialty um, passively are important for every single patient. Right. Like if for different patients, if we're able to do sentiment analysis and, um, you know, understand if they are gaining weight over time or um, if they're before they're on the verge of a break, you know, psychotic break, if we're able to determine that based on different behavioral factors or physical factors, then we want to be able to alert the patient and provider ahead of time. So we're all about preventative health care and. Uh, being smart about developing meaningful sensors, both hardware and software sensors into patient homes um, so that we can understand them better and, uh, you know, provide actionable insights to providers to give better care and more preventative care to their patients. And for chronically ill patients, it's really to provide what, what wraparound care um, really looks like, you know, treating the patient as a whole. What we have found is that a lot of psych patients um, have a lot of physical problems as well, but they just have so much trust in their psychiatrist that they're who they're going to um, again and again, you know, and so the psychiatrist, then it, it kind of falls on them to say, you know, we need to treat you not as just a psych patient, but as like a, you know, a whole patient. And how do we provide the tools to, you know, allow providers to give that kind of um, care to their patients, because that's kind of going above and beyond, but something that seems to be necessary in today's era. So uh, th those are those are some of the things that uh, we as a company are trying to work on. I think there's so much fascinating work that's being done in the space right now, um, you know, with remote care and all of the efforts that are made around telehealth and, um, you know, trying to provide therapy for patients, you know, wherever they are. I think all of that is so um, fantastic and has really opened the door for access. And now it's really about building and creating what that quality experience looks like and providing more actionable insights to providers, I think is what, what we have to really focus on. Excellent. Thank you. And then we have, we have 
One more question from Dr. Arzubi, and then I want to ask Reza if he has anything. I know that he's got to leave. He he's got a meeting with our governor shortly, so we we don't want to drag him at the end of this meeting. So the the question from Dr. Arzubi is, um, what what do you mean by sentiment analysis? So there are a lot of really cool companies that um, exist that are trying to understand if there's certain patterns in the way that patients, you know, when they're texting um, or when they are typing the kinds of words that they're using, um, you know, how erratic their texting is, um, just the patterns in which they are searching for different things, what they're looking up, all of that, you know, it, it really is around a computer trying to understand what all of that means and seeing if there's anything actionable to provide from that. You know, is the patient based on all of these different factors and how the patient is interacting with technology, is it possible that the patient's depression is worsening or, um, you know, over time and, and, or if they're becoming more symptomatic over time, or if it sounds like they've maybe stopped taking their meds, different things like that. And so um, th those are some of the efforts that are being kind of pushed forward by some of the other companies in the space. Great, thank you. Raisa, can you give us some of your parting thoughts or questions? Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for having me, by the way, and, and putting this on. Um, uh, Matt's one of our, <clears throat> excuse me, he's one of our advisors for Frontier and just, um, I, I always uh, like to say, I'm sorry, Matt, I got to do this to you. I just sing your praises because I find Matt to be just one of the most amazing advocates for mental health I've ever come across. And the work he's done in Montana is, you know, is amazing. If, if every state had a Matt, I think I probably wouldn't have a job. So, you know, I'd just be <laughs> hanging out on the beach. So that'd be great. Um, but in terms of um, parting thoughts, uh, you know, I, I, you know, Thanks everyone for, for joining to talk about this. I think the reality is, you know, uh, COVID really put uh, threw a little bit of gasoline on the fire when it came to adoption of uh, technology for use in healthcare across the board. Um, psychiatry, mental health, behavioral health tends to be the biggest adopter for, for many obvious reasons. You know, it, it tends to be easier in some ways. We can do the majority of our work uh, hands off. Um, there are some things like the, AIMS exam, the involuntary movement scale, things like that for long-term psycho, um, psychotropics like antipsychotics that we still do, but we can do most of that uh, via video <clears throat> in terms of seeing for those side effects. So now that we're seeing this trend, now it's it's sort of here to stay. What you know, As payers have started to almost pull back a little bit with the public health emergency over, they're finding that Medicare beneficiaries, uh, members of different payers, they want, to, they want this kept. They want to be able to uh, see their doctors remotely. The, the bigger thing we're seeing is it's the providers that are sort of have some, a little bit stronger preference to go back to in-person than any patients. Patients love remote care. So what I love about this is this is putting a tool in the hands of patients. It's also helping the providers to help the providers feel more comfortable. So the better adoption we have with remote patient monitoring, actually it brings the provider satisfaction, I think, up where the patients are. Because on the patient's end, right, <clears throat> they're getting what they need for the most part in terms of jumping on a video and getting their questions answered, it's on the provider side often that we're saying, well, well, where's the blood pressure? Where's this data? Where's that data? You know, I, I need this to make the decision. Absolutely. So this is, I think, really bringing some um, parity to satisfaction levels. That's what I like about it. And so we have a, a growing number of providers, just even just selfishly in our own practice, right? At Frontier, I have to report to I don't know, a couple dozen providers now. And so I need to be able to tell them, hey, I really want you to use remote patient monitoring, by the way, you know, um, you're going to have to log into a separate system or take all these separate steps. We're eliminating all that. So now they can have at their fingertips. So those would be my parting thoughts is I think this is critical to the success of telehealth across the board, even not just telemental health, telebehavioral health. Um, and so as, as this energy and as a company like Athelis does the hard work and gets this in the hands of patients, um, it's really making this, you know, care delivery at home on demand uh, possible. Okay. Thank you so, so much, Reza. Th thank you for your kind words too. We, we, uh, we're our, our real team here and, and I'm fortunate to, 
to be part of it. Um, and for that team, I, I, I really want to highlight Dr. Gary and, and Sandra Mahelish, who are also on the panel. Uh, Gary, Gary, I haven't heard anybody tout clozapine and clozapine care like you, or as consistently. And you know, NAMI National is pu is pushing it now. But do do you have any any thoughts to share with people about maybe? your family's journey and what this what this means to you and if if you can't share that because your yeah. wife is kicking you under the table my wife so. just left so i'm okay <laughs> no for i i've been involved i have a family member a son who's lived with serious mental illness for 38 years and the first few years the first seven years were i like to say just hell and uh in 1991, after trials of four neuroleptics or three neuroleptics, the a psychiatrist told us this is the last chance we got. In 1991, he was diagnosed with treatment resistant schizophrenia. And he's been on Clozabril since 1991. And it saved his life, it saved our family. And uh, I, you know, I, I just, I guess it, I read this last week that only uh, the doctor said 5%. I read 6% of the people with schizophrenia on Clausewell would be saving a whole lot of lives and a whole lot of money if we had more people on clozapine Clausewell. And uh, it's been a lifesaver with us. We deal with the side effects and they are there, but we have a good psychiatrist and a good good psychiatric nurse practitioner and he works full time and he has a life and it was clozaril clozapine that did it and it's been 31 years he's now 52 and he has a life so that's all i have to say thanks matt yeah. Thank you so much, Gary. And uh, Gary, Gary's son was one of my idols grow, growing up on the swim team. And to be able to see him come back to his life and engage with his life, I mean, that that's what NAMI's all about from, from my standpoint. So uh, to, to pick up, I'm gonna hit you up with like one, one or two last questions, I guess for our audience probably can't understand quite what your journey was to be as young as you were and kind of launching a company it's remarkable to to me and i think it it really gives us hope for what's coming can, can you tell us a, a little bit about what your path was like so people can get a feel for who you are and what yeah. got you here yeah sure um you know, I, I grew up in the Bay Area uh, in California, in Northern California. So um, it, was, it was a real privilege growing up here, being surrounded by technology and startups at such a young age. Um, you know, it was very much of a builder environment. And so I was always very much involved in science fairs, you know, since I was a kid and um, going to high school in the Bay Area, I like made science fairs like a competitive sport you were clearly an athlete who was swimming and I was doing science fairs. So, um, you know, that, that's what I did. And I, I learned from a lot of people far smarter than me. And um, I started researching um, at Stanford in the department of radiology uh, in, in molecular imaging. And that's how I got exposed to uh, molecular imaging and uh, the power of imaging and uh, machine learning, you know, it used in compound with uh, really intelligent imaging. And so if you think about the device and what it actually is doing, it is at the confluence of machine learning, which my co-founder today um, was studying at the and researching at 
the machine learning lab, at ML lab at Stanford, and I was doing imaging work at Stanford. And so if you think about what the device does, it's literally right at the confluence of what we both were researching. And, you know, like I said, we never intended for this to be a company. It was always something that was a passion project. And for us now, you know, we, we've raised a lot of money um, at big valuations, but our goal is to bring the might and the velocity of technology and Silicon Valley to medicine. And so if there are places that we can automate and provide these really meaningful insights and develop interesting tools that might not have existed before that can be life-changing for patients, then we are committed to doing that. And so, um, you know, path has been windy. It's like I said, started in oncology and had to get a clearance. It was focusing a lot on clinical trials um, and then found ourselves in working very deeply in SMI um, with SMI patients and, uh, you know, like have pivoted along the way, but been a fascinating journey. And we are, you know, happy to be able to serve, uh, you know, communities that uh, kind of need it the most. So, uh, you know, we feel very humble to be in that space. Thank you so much. We are just so delighted at the work that you do. I mean, for us to have you focusing in a way on serious mental illness and how to get the people that need it the most care and for real providers in Montana, like Frontier Psychiatry to already be using it as just really gives us a, a lot of hope. Um, so th thank you for joining us to, today. We're, I'm gonna wrap this up, but as we wrap this up, we've got one more speaker for our, our series, and that is Dr. Tom Ansel, the former director of the National Institute of Mental Health will, will be here for May. So everybody, please mark your calendars for May. 11th, it's going to be the last of our speaker series for this spring. Um, this was just absolutely wonderful, Topeka. Th thank you. And Raisa, thank you so much for joining. I think being able to get the combination of the two of you made it so much more real and pow powerful for our audience. Mm -hmm. Very welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you, guys. Yeah, likewise. Okay. Awesome. Th thanks, everyone. Ha have a great rest of your day.